thanks for joining in for uh, this episode. Hopefully this won't be as heavy as the previous week's podcast, the previous episode, uh, but we are excited to have our first guest, uh, Joe, on today's episode. He's going to give us a little whiskey 101, and then we're going to jump into pandemic and being a father, what the Bible says, what our experiences say, what God says. But before we do that, let's get into this whiskey. We are the Old Fashioned Dad Podcast, seeking to love dads through the person and work of Jesus Christ, entering into tough conversations on faith, God's calling, marriage, parenting, sex, all while enjoying good whiskey. I'm Christian Bringoff. And I'm Christian Harris. Thanks for joining us. Gents, welcome, Joe. Big welcome to you. Uh, Thank so you. gracious and kind to come on the podcast, uh, seeing that you're two hours ahead of us, so 10 o'clock, so... Uh, I assume that you probably, being a being a father of a young one, you probably don't go to bed until four in the morning anyways. Yeah, so. I don't really sleep much. No, that's not true. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't sleep for the first eight months of her life, and uh, so now we get as much sleep as we can. And I had some espresso tonight, so it's it's helped me stay up, which is good. <laughs> <laughs> and t- uh, tell your wife thank you for uh, lending you to us. We, yeah. we are greatly appreciative, and our listeners are going to be I think really uh, appreciate there today. You're going to do uh, a little uh, whiskey education 101, if you if you want to call it that, um, and then you're also going to kind of uh, jump into some of your thoughts on on today's topic of uh, pandemic responses in the Bible and God. I know those. I know you're going to nail it down for all of us because uh, <laughs> you know we're all in need of some desperate guidance, and you're going to be able to be the one that really nails it down so that we know exactly how to respond. And if you don't give us the right answers coming back for you, buddy. That, that's fine. Well, hey, I'm no expert, but I'm going to do my best. Okay. I'm going to treat you that? like the expert though. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. You're in good company. None of us know what we're doing. So. Oh, good. Good. Um, so why don't we, uh, before we, before we get into any of the kind of, uh, Joe, you, you telling us about whiskey and stuff like that and our listeners about whiskey, why don't we, what are, what are we all sipping on tonight? So uh, mm-hmm. I'm getting into some, oh, Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no go get no. Joe. Hey, this sure, round table, you sure. shout it I'm, out. I know you guys can't see this, but I'm showing up a label of Knob Creek twice barreled rye. Uh, it's mm. at 100 proof, so 50% ABV. Um, no age statement on this, so I'm assuming it's at least two years old, if not four. Um, it's a double barreled version of their rye, and we're going to kind of mm. talk about some finishings later and double yep. barons later. But uh, this is pretty good stuff. I'd recommend picking it up. It's about 40, 45 bucks if you like rye. Um, it's a little oaky. It's really, really tasty stuff. I think that's, I think, uh, well, I picked up, uh, Christian and I are drinking, uh, Knob Creek nine year, and it is also a hundred proof, not double barreled. If it is double barreled, they didn't put it on there, but I'm assuming it's only one barrel. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to sip it really quick because I haven't had it for a couple of days. So I forgot what it tasted like. Mm. Yeah, that's got a that's got a quick sweet taste right away. For at least on the bourbon one. Yeah, on the rye, I mean, it's it's very it's oak forward because it's a it's a second barreling, so you get a lot more of those char notes. But uh, it's it's oak forward and rye forward, which is kind of what I expected from this. It's really tasty. I like it. It's kind of like a really good like punches your palate with a lot of flavor up front. So this is the part where I really love asking Christian, uh, what do you what, what do you pick up? <laughs> When you're when you're drinking this whiskey, and when he first started, he was like, "I'm tasting alcohol." I, I, I love it. I love it. So, Christian, uh, what do you think of this one? Uh, it's I, al- yeah, alcohol. Uh, I'm, I'm getting some of the oak. Some of the I do taste kind of the oakiness. Uh, now, I don't know single barrel, double barrel. Maybe we'll get into that in our our whiskey 101. But uh, for people like me, hopefully, uh, this education from you, Joe, will be will be good. Well, cool. I hope hope I can uh, shed some light tonight. Yeah. So, uh, Joe, uh, to, you know, to kind of keep me on track, I was, you know, I was going through like, Hey, what would, what would, uh, people that are tuning in that maybe don't know anything about whiskey, don't even necessarily know where whiskey comes from, uh, or bourbon, uh, or that there's differences in whiskeys and whiskey regions, like what would they want to know? Um, and I think when you offered like, Hey, let's, let's, let me do a little teaching. I think man, that was perfect. That was, that was awesome. Awesome. So, um, 
but before we uh, jump to that, um, I want to ask you a couple of quick questions so that people kind of let their guard down and so that they feel really comfortable about being taught by you. <laughs> sure, um, man. Let's, let's fire away. Let's go for it. Yeah. So uh, you've been married uh, for a little while, right? Yeah. Uh, five and a half years. Just about. Five and a, okay. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, that's enough time for it to, you know, the honeymoon's officially over and you, you're definitely into the nitty gritty of marriage. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. For sure. And you got one, two, nine or 10 kids? Uh, you know, 14 playing on 15. No, I'm just kidding. Wow. Uh, wow. no, <laughs> you're looking got, great. We've, we've got one daughter. Um, you know, we'd like to have two or three kids, uh, eventually, but, uh, we have one daughter right now. She is, She's my wife's putting up three fingers. Um, she's a, <laughs> she, she's a two years old. Um, she runs the house, and I'm sure you guys know, especially with having at least one kid, that that first kid probably turns your life upside down. So um, we've learned the a second lot from kid her. does too as well. Oh yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> well, hopefully we'll get there and we'll learn from number two and eventually number three. But yeah, right now just one. Um, and she's her name is Carter Jean, and she's a firecracker of a southerner and uh she's fantastic <laughs> nice. So where, nice where are you guys located at uh, i'm in birmingham alabama okay yeah and and just for context for the show i guess how do you guys know each other so um christian posts some really cool stuff on instagram and uh he has this little account it's it, you know it's not that big it's like denim and whiskey he's got something like a measly thirty thousand followers you know no big deal um <laughs> no he has an awesome hundred, account no which one's bigger and uh, so, yeah and uh <laughs> no but i actually um christian put up a post one day and it was i had already been following for a little bit and it was he was talking about his faith and how he's you know he's like i you know, i'm just gonna go out there i'm gonna go on a limb this is who i am and i was like i was really blown away by way by that and i was like this guy has integrity especially with having a following the way he does it just shows that he doesn't care about who follows and how many people he has, he's going to be transparent. And I really, I saw, I saw integrity in that. And so I was like, this is somebody I want to get to know. And so from there, I just kind of messaged him and we just gone back and forth. We've done a few lives, talked and now here I am. So, uh, so yeah, so I guess Christian bring off. Thanks for being a uh, transparent. Dude. Thanks Joe. I appreciate that. Uh, and uh, it made me blush man with that, <laughs> with that post. Cause I, I honestly didn't think that was like, it was going to go anywhere, but uh, you know, it touched on a few people and, and uh, I'm glad that it made a connection with you. So I really, I really appreciate that. Yeah, man. Amen um, to that. Yeah, man. Um, uh, what, uh, sorry, Christian, did, did you have any other questions for Joe before I jump back and asking him more questions? Uh, maybe for our listeners uh, and for me, cause I don't know, Joe, uh, perfect, what, what's, perfect. Uh, other than being a, a you know, a dad, um, mm -hmm. it sounds like you're into whiskey. How did you get to know it? You know, how, how how, what are your credentials for giving us a whiskey one on one? Yeah, sure. So, um, I, I you know I escaped out to the far reaches of no. <laughs> so I uh, I guess I'll give you a quick background if that's okay. Yeah. So um, about seven years ago, uh, I just started working first full time job, I guess first big boy job after college, and I was on a work trip with a few friends, uh, coworkers, I guess, became friends, and um, we were we just gotten into our hotel for the week for a week long project. We were all traveling from out of town. We had a nightcap, and one of the guys ordered an old-fashioned. I said, you know, what is that? What, what kind of cocktail is that? He goes, well, it's a whiskey-based cocktail. I said, okay, I've never really tried whiskey. And he's like, well, try this. So I tried his cocktail, and I said, that's strong, but it's really delicious. So I kind of I started there. I started with cocktails and got into flavored whiskeys and got into drinking whiskey water or on ice and then got to drinking whiskey meat. And seven years later, I've pursued a um, – I pursued learning more about the education, the fundamentals of whiskey and whatnot. So I became a certified bourbon steward earlier this year, about four or five months ago through Save and Keep Society. Um, took an exam for that and uh, learned a lot. Actually, I'm going to hold up the book. I know your viewers can't see this, but this is what the book looks like. Nice, and, uh, nice. Anybody who's interested in just learning more or having a good resource on whiskey education, look up Save and Keep Society. They sell a book for about 60 bucks. Um, you can get your exam certification through it, or you can just have it as a really great resource. And, um, you know, the more, I guess, to answer your question, the more I got into whiskey and learned, started learning more, the more I wanted to be well-educated about it. I wanted to be a well-educated, savvy consumer. So um, that's kind of what took me down the rabbit hole of whiskey education. Hmm. And uh, I guess that's kind of why I'm also here tonight. <laughs> 
Okay. So um, I think you kind of already answered uh, one of my questions of like why bourbon, but like um, you already kind of jumped into that. So let, mm -hmm. let's, let's jump into some of the, the terms that I think can be kind of confusing for uh, people in whiskey. Um, this could be an entire episode, obviously, uh, right. especially like dissecting whiskey by region, Scotland, Ireland, Japan, Canada, America, even Australia and, and Mexico now. But, um, but America, uh, we're, we're sipping on American bourbon. Bourbon is an American thing, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and bourbon is different than um, like an American whiskey. So bourbon has to be um, a specific mash bill, right? Yeah, there's a lot that goes into bourbon. Um, and a lot of people don't realize that you hit on the first thing. And I'm just going to walk through these criteria real quick. Yeah, you can yeah. Kind of dive, dive a little deeper. But so first and foremost, at least in my mind, bourbon has to be made in the U.S. So yeah. the next six things I'm about to say, anybody can make it anywhere else in the world. But if it's not made in the U.S., it's not considered bourbon. So it has to be a U.S. product. Um, you touched on the mash bill. The mash bill has to be at least 51% corn. So at least 51% of the percentage of the rye of the recipe has to be corn based. So the um, mash bill is the recipe. Yeah, the mash bill is the recipe. And typically yeah. to break down, break it down, the mash bill for bourbon is typically corn, rye, and malted barley. Mm. Um, some people deviate, they add a fourth grade in there, or they take a grain out. They may only have two grains. Some do 100% corn based, um, which is fine. It just depends on what they want to do. Uh, but, but typically bourbon has at least 51% corn to be considered bourbon. Um, and it has usually two other grains as well. Yeah. Um, okay. so moving on, um, yeah. it has to be distilled no higher than 160 proof. So, um, 80% ABV, uh, it has to be entered in the barrel, no higher than 125 proof. So it's actually, if it's proof, if it's distilled, you know, higher than 125 proof, it's actually proof down with, with the water before it enters the barrel if necessary. Um, not always the case, not, and everybody's always, you know, distilling higher than 125. And that's, right. and when they're, and when they're bringing the proof down, um, mm -hmm. with, with bourbon, it's, it's, is it normal everyday tap water or is it, um, some sort so of, some, yeah, so, you know, some people swear by they only use limestone water. Some distilleries are tapped into city water. It just depends on what their source is. Um, okay. you know, you know, Kentucky where bourbon like is their that's their homeland even though bourbon can be made anywhere in the U S um, Kentucky's where it kind of started and Kentucky naturally sits over a bed of limestone, which is a fantastic source of water, which is why Kentucky bourbon is some of the most sought after product in bourbon. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but it's not always the case. Not everybody has lime, a limestone bed sitting below them. So, you know, sometimes they use the tap from city water it just depends on what their water source is. Yeah. Good question though. Um, so moving on, another thing, um, it has to be aged in a new charred oak container. Um, you know, typically it's a barrel, obviously, brand new um, uh, white oak, um, and it has to be charred on the inside, being, being that it's actually, the inside's actually fired up and toasted, and then actually has a, like this caramelized char on the inside, which helps to um, basically work with the bourbon to help caramelize some of the flavors, pull the enzymes in and out of the wood. It gives bourbon its flavor. Um, so you get that. And it, it, you know, like, it, like I said, it's typically a barrel. Sometimes people will use other sorts of containers, but typically it's a barrel just from history and tradition. Um, and then after it's, uh, after it ages and whatnot, it has to be bottled. Well, it can't be bottled any lower than 80 proof. If it's bottled lower than 80 proof, it's not considered bourbon. And then lastly, um, it contains no added substances other than water. So when you proof a bourbon down, so say you distill it at 160, it enters the barrel at 125. Okay, now you're ready to proof it. Um, and it's when you go to dump it, it's at 125 proof and you want to proof it down to 90 proof. You can only use water to proof down bourbon. Okay. okay? And that's, yeah. that's the basics of bourbon. Um, it sounds more complicated than it is, but once you break it down, it's, it's pretty simple. Yeah. And, and these, and, and these laws, I know that, that like were put in place obviously to prevent, um, or these criteria was put in place to, to prevent, you know, fraud and, um, like degradating the quality, um, yeah. of the bourbon, you know, whiskey products. I know the Scotch, uh, Scotch is, or Scott, Scottish, there we go. Um, they, they have some really, really strict laws. And I think it was mm -hmm. the Scottish that came over to America and introduced whiskey and then, you know, 
called it bourbon because you can't call it scotch whiskey in America. But yeah, uh, well, it's you know what's cool is 1964 was the year that bourbon was given its uh, lawful name. Hmm. So it wasn't until 1964 that bourbon was declared bourbon. Hmm. If that makes if that makes sense. Um, so uh, I, 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 I didn't I didn't know that little historical fact, but yeah, good to know. Yeah. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of use, useless tidbits I'm going to throw out there tonight. <laughs> <laughs> that probably being one of them. Um, but yeah, it wasn't until 1964 that bourbon was declared bourbon whiskey, a product of the U.S. only. Mm. Um, can I, I have throw a question? A if, yeah, yeah go, for it. go ahead. Yeah. Um, so uh, where's the term proof come from? I mean, why do they say that instead of just alcohol percentage? So proof is just double the ABV al alcohol by volume. Um, I don't... I don't actually know where the term proof came from. I think it, don't quote me on this. I believe it's related to proof gallons. So um, to, to rewind a little bit, there was a, in 1897, there was a law put in place to define bottled and bond bourbon, which I'm going to get into that a little bit later. And that's one of Christian bring off questions. Um, but whiskey was defined by proof gallons. And so a hundred proof was an easy way to cut it because it was 50% was half of, what made up the total um, volume, basically. So 50% alcohol by volume. Mm -hmm. um, so I believe that's where it came from. Don't quote me on that. Um, I will maybe, quote you on that. Maybe we can get one of your listeners to uh, <laughs> give us an answer on that. How about that? Yeah, listeners, uh, feel free to chime in on the comments um, of this. We'd love to hear or uh, shoot us an answer message on the Old Fashioned Dad podcast uh, Instagram page. Um, so uh, uh, Christian Harris, do you, any other questions off of what, uh, Joe was saying? No, I'm done derailing the conversation. Go ahead. <laughs> oh man. I love derailing. It's the best part of the conversation. You're, you're going to uh, learn more and forget more than you've ever wanted to tonight. I promise. <laughs> sweet. Your brain is going to leave exactly the way it came in. Um, <laughs> um, so let's go over just a couple of, a couple of terms that I, I personally found confusing when I entered into the, uh, bourbon and whiskey world, but, um, single barrel, what, what does that mean? Yeah, so uh, basically it, it's kind of pretty broken down to the, what the actual term means. So single barrel whiskey is whiskey that was pulled from a single barrel. So if I have a bottle of single barrel um, Baker's bourbon, for example, all the bourbon mm. in that bottle was from one barrel. It wasn't blended with multiple barrels. Um, it was just pulled from one barrel. So that probably made, you know, 140 to 220 bottles. And that barrel is going to probably be different than another barrel that was aged in a different part of the rickhouse dumped in a different part of the year with a different age statement. So, so is there, um, a, I was just going to say, is there a, a benefit? I mean, it sounds like if it's, it sounds like you might have more inconsistencies with single barrel. Yeah. And, and you typically do. Um, it just depends on, you know, some distilleries have a flavor profile they're going for. They're trying to reach. Um, but sometimes with single barrels, like you'll have cool one-offs like a Buffalo Trace, for example, you have a standard offering of Buffalo Trace. Some stores will do what they call store pick or a barrel pick, and they'll pick from one barrel or maybe a few barrels, and they'll have it bottled individually. And then if you were to put those two side by side, you typically can notice a unique difference between the standard Buffalo Trace and the store pick Buffalo Trace. Um, mm -hmm. So some of the cool things about single barrels is they can offer phenomenal flavor for the same value, which is some of the wins you get of a single barrel bourbon. Um, or rye whiskey or single malt or whatever it may be. So the term single barrel, like Christian was asking earlier, um, isn't just related to bourbon. It can be rye whiskey. It can be single malt. Mm -hmm. It can be American whiskey. I mean, I'm sure Scotch do it and Irish whiskey do it too, but yeah. it's really common in, in bourbon and rye. Yeah. You don't, I don't think that you see, uh, I mean, they might have a different term for it. I, um, I haven't seen it a ton, but uh, with Scotch whiskey, I haven't seen like single barrel, um, done a whole lot the the balvany use uses the term uh, double wood which you know is like the finished whiskey but um i, I know in the, i know in the bourbon world uh, there tends to be more attention given towards a single barrel whiskey as opposed to just kind of a you know it's, it's just a bourbon you know uh, the, the single barrel seem to hold a little bit more of a kind of uh, a collector uh incentive or mentality Steve. yeah I think it does yes, in a sense because uh, especially a store picks, um, you know, store picks are, are usually single barrels. They're not usually blended. People tend to drive towards wanting a store pick, especially if they have a store that has a really good or the owner who has a great palate that picks a really good barrel, like a honey barrel, mm -hmm. essentially. So um, like 
I think of Knob Creek, actually, ironically, we're drinking that tonight, but Knob Creek, a lot of people do store picks of Knob Creek, and you get, you know, they can be vastly different than the flavor profile of what a, what a blended nine-year Knob Creek is. Mm -hmm. um, but for the same price you're paying for a standard offering bottle, you may get one that's immensely better for the same price. And so the value you place on that single barrel is, it's like you said, so much more sought after, so much more mystique because um, people want that. They want that difference. They want that, that honey bottle, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, let, let's go over a couple more terms before we, we transition into, yeah. you know, the pandemic. Um, <laughs> so uh, quickly go over the term barrel uh, proof mm -hmm. and also get into like finished whiskey. Sure. So barrel proof. Um, that's kind of another pretty simple term. Basically, it refers to a whiskey that is bottled at the same proof that it was dumped from the barrel. So no, well, no water was added to it. So for example, um, I'm going to use Wild Turkey Rare Breed um, as an example. It was, it's uh, on the label you read, it says 116.8 proof. That means the proof that is in that bottle of whiskey is the same proof that it was dumped from the barrel um, when, they, when they chose to dump the barrel. So it's no different than when they took it, took it out of the barrel and dumped it, basically. It wasn't no cut water, with, with any yeah, water. It wasn't cut with any water, right. Yeah. yeah. And then you said finished whiskeys. Yeah. Um, this is a, this is a really cool uh, topic, a really hot topic right now, but yep. this is nothing new. I think this is just kind of really hot with bourbon and rye whiskey right now or American whiskey in general. But, um, you know, to be finished, it's entered into an additional barrel after its original barreling. So um, you take a, take a rye, we'll say you dump it into a vat and then you put it into a X, um, X sherry barrel and X port barrel, something like that. Because yep. you want to then age it into another barrel to, to uh, infuse a different flavor profile onto the whiskey. So maybe you want to infuse sherry notes or port notes or whatever it may be. Um, so basically the whiskey now takes on a completely different flavor profile from what it had originally from the first barrel, the initial barrel. Cool. Yeah, and I know that, I know that some of the controversy is can you still call it a bourbon um, after it's been finished? Um, even if it meets the initial criteria prior to the, you know, the second aging, I, I know that some uh, bourbon aficionados would be like, nope, it's just finished whiskey. It's not a bourbon yeah. anymore. It's one of those things that kind of like, like, you know, you get a fly in your eye and you just can't stop like twitching. Like, yeah. you know, it's kind of like, I almost <laughs> have like a brain aneurysm and I'm just like, uh, I just kind of like, I start, I start short circuiting a little bit, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, it, it, the problem with finished whiskeys, finished bourbons, finished ryes, whatever you may call them, is that there's no category that's defining a finished bourbon or a finished whiskey. So we mm -hmm. call them bourbons and we call them ryes, even though at the end of the day, they, they've had two barrelings. And, they, and the second barreling typically, unless it's a brand new charred oak barrel, is not, is not that, right? It's an X barrel. It's an X cask of a, of a sherry barrel or a port barrel or a beer barrel or something whatever it may be, maple syrup, you know? So anything that's not a new cask oak, a charred oak container is technically it's not bourbon anymore, but we don't have a category for it. So people still say bourbon finished in X cask, for example. Got it. So Got it's, it. uh, yeah, anyways, point of contention, but there's nothing you can do about it right now, unfortunately. Sure, sure. And, and maybe some of our listeners know exactly what you're talking about. If they don't, now they do. Um, Let's go over one other term and then we'll kind of move into, you know, what our topic, um, and you already kind of brought it up a little bit, bottled and bond. And I know I've brought that up with Christian. I've said mm -hmm. that once or twice before with them before. So, um, it's once, once you understand it, it's actually a fairly straightforward thing, but, um, uh, but, uh, go over bottled and bond. Yeah, sure. So bottled and bond, uh, quick history on it. It was defined in 1897 because of, um, rectifiers making basically, uh, fake whiskey essentially because they were putting, tobacco spit and others and sulfur and other stuff. And rat whiskey. poison, weren't they? Rat or poison. Yeah, yeah. That's why they call it. They actually used to call whiskey rat gut because it would actually tear your gut up. It was that bad. Um, and so there was no, this was actually in 1897 when they defined bottled and bond, it was before FDA became a thing in 1906. Mm. So feel free to fact check me. I may have my year wrong on FDA. I know I have my year right on the bottled and bond. Act, <laughs> but um so that was put in place and that became kind of an accolade for whiskey and the reason why it was important was because of rectifiers at the time but to be considered a bottled and bond it has to be a, be a minimum of four years old 
um, and age in a government bonded warehouse. That was actually a thing at the time. The government used to actually regulate watching warehouses or rick houses that, that whiskey was aged in. Yeah. Um, it has to be bottled at 100 proof, which is kind of going back to Christian Harris, what you said earlier, um, related to proof. They actually used 100 because it was just an even keel number. It was an easy way to tax the whiskey, easy way to keep track of it. So bottled, bottled at 100 proof exactly. Um, must be made at one distillery and must be made in one distilling season. And the distilling season was January, June, or July to December. And this goes back to regulating consistency, age, blends, all that, all that stuff. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Bottled and bond typically, um, I've I've found um, can mean at least at the very least more consistency and and at times higher quality. Yeah, and and, that, and that's kind of what it, what it used to stand for, and it still does. Um, definitely stands for higher quality, especially when we had the issue of rectifying whiskey back in pre 1900s. Right. Um, and it definitely is something that people still, um, seek after. Uh, one example that comes to mind is old Fitzgerald bottled and bond. Yeah. It's 15 uh, year old. Yeah. It's 15. I think there's, there's everything from nine, 10, uh, not sorry, nine, 11, 13, 14, 15, maybe 16. I can't remember. Don't, don't quote me on all the labels, but, um, yeah, it's, it's all over the board, but everybody wants it because it's, fantastic whiskey um joe that uh reminds me we didn't do this at the very beginning of the uh, uh of the episode here but uh how can people find you uh on uh the social medias sure sure so um i'm on one platform i'm on this little social media platform called instagram and i think my- i've heard of it yeah, yeah, it's you know all the all the kids are talking about it these days. Uh, okay, it's supposed to be like the next best thing, big thing. I don't know, <laughs> but, but uh, my tag is is uh, at of cask and claro. Uh, so O F C A S K A N D C L A R O. So that's uh, that's where you can find me. Okay, and and we're, we'll find uh, if I remember right, uh, all things whiskey and cigars. Yeah, all things whiskey and cigars. Sometimes there's a few other things thrown in there, but it's always going to be related to those two things. Nice, 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 mm-hmm. nice. Um, well, why don't we why don't we transition, jump into um, the the fathering stuff? Because uh, I think for the fathers that tuned in that don't care about whiskey, they're like probably, hey, when are we going to get to the father stuff? And the whiskey people <laughs> that don't want to know anything about the fathering are like, all right, this is where we tune out. Um, Let's but- do it. Uh, we're all dads here, obviously, and uh, we're all believers. And I, it, there's a segment here I think we can um, get into maybe maybe near the end uh, of uh, reaching out to also like dads that, you know, honestly, they don't believe in Jesus. Or they don't know. They haven't had any experience or um, uh, uh, thoughts or raised of hearing about Jesus. But um, let's just start with the basic Joe, I, I've, I've met you and I've talked with you on Instagram um, and you seem genuine and legit to me. And, <laughs> but I, but I know that I, I like, I, I think we've shared enough about our theology that it seems like we're on the, we're on the same page, but you're a Christian, right? Yep. I am a Christian, but my name is not Christian. I know. It would have been really amazing. I'm not if you the third were. Christian on here. I'm not the <laughs> trifecta of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been, that would have been good. Um, so uh, uh, you became a Christian. It, it sounds like sometime in college. Yeah. Yeah. So I, um, actually grew up Roman Catholic and, um, you know, so I had a, had this understanding of Jesus and, and God and the Trinity and all of that, but it was never really taught to me in depth until I got to college. And, um, it was probably between my freshman and sophomore year. I actually went to, uh, some of you guys may know this crew or campus crusade for Christ. Um, yeah, I actually yeah. started going to that with a friend of mine and it was through that getting discipled, going to church again, um, being around Christians, seeing there's something different about who they were, how they acted, how they lo- generally just loved people that really gravitated in my heart. And I was like, I want what they have. And what I realized is that they had Jesus. And so I was like, okay, what does that mean based on the background I grew up with? Right. Mm. And so um, what I'd come to learn is it just, it just transformed everything I ever believed. And I was like, all right, well, this is what it means to be a Christian. I want to be a Christian. And so that's how I became, that's basically just through those interactions through crew and kind of going through, going back, going to a Christian church versus a Catholic church. 
um, I learned a lot of different things and getting discipled mm-hmm. as well by one of my friend, my good friends in college at the time. So, um, yeah, that's how I became a Christian. So that was about, that was 20, 2008. So about 12 years ago, roughly. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Um, so, uh, thanks for, I mean, I appreciate you sharing that and breaking that down for our listeners. I think it's always important to hear, um, kind of the beginning points, uh, of a lot of believers and where they, you know, how they came to know. So, um, I, I don't know if you guys are aware, but we're going through this thing. It's, um, I think they pronounce it endemic. No, Pan- pandemic. Mm-hmm. That's it. That's it. We're, we're going through, uh, a little bit of a crisis at the moment. I, are you guys aware of this? She's got the dad jokes. Ah, <laughs> used to me, man. I've just been in my house for two months. Okay, just vacation, uh, stay, uh, staycation, right? Yeah, my work just said, hey, just, just you know, hold up at home. No big deal. No particular reason to stay home, no, you know. No, just stay at home. Right. Maybe don't leave yeah. your house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, on, on a couple of the episodes, Christian and I, we, we've talked about just, you know, kind of rift off of, you know, our experiences of the week and the day, obviously. Um, being in quarantine has been um, anything but fun. Uh, but there has been surprising stuff, at least for me, that's kind of come up. But it's also I, I've paid attention to the news. I've paid attention to, you know, family and friend conversations. And uh, and in a lot of these conversations, these are coming from, you know, other Christians. And I, I've been uh, excited is really not the word, but um, shocked, surprised, maybe disappointed at times at some of the way in which uh human beings, other Christians, at least in my, my vicinity, my circle of influence are responding. Uh, Christian, I'm really disappointed in your response. No, I'm kidding. Um, I had a response? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> I, mean, I was going to talk to you about it after. No, I'm kidding. I just do what my uh, wife tells me to do. She tells me not to leave the house <laughs> and to order everything online. So, Intervention, intervention, intervention. <laughs> <laughs> this is where Joe's like, I'm out. I don't know. Okay. Um, <laughs> just drama. But um, I... I'm kind of I'm kind of curious and kind of question just for both of you guys really. Um, Joe, I know you gave some gave some insight on on some of the previous conversations and and uh, stuff you kind of emailed me, but uh, I'd be kind of curious to hear from both of you guys just what you're experiencing in terms of um, maybe family and friends and you know pandemic responses or maybe even church members that are in your life. You know, I'd love to maybe start with Christian. I don't know, whatever, free for all, go. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, I think we've heard a little bit about, you know, we had a little discussion about it. Um, I mean, in, in, I don't know, I mean, in, in general, it's, it's, it's been okay. I mean, I, I, I try to look at things big picture. That's kind of my default is like, let's, let's try to get perspective on things. Um, and I think traveling the world, being in the military and, and, you know, being in combat stuff is going to give me a little bit of that. So when the hardest thing I'm going through is, Hey, you have to stay at home and buy stuff online, like, well, it could be worse. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, granted, you know, economically and a lot of people, you know, unemployment's super high and it's been a hit to, to my business and I've had to make some big, big shifts. You know, initially it was, it was super hard because I was basically like, hey, I'm out of money. Business is grinding to a halt because of the, the stay home, you know, uh, orders here in Washington state and whatnot. And, uh, and so I had to just, just, just slash my, my costs to just keep afloat, you know, and mm. keep food on the table. Um, that's eased up with some of the economic recovery stuff and, you know, small business loans and whatnot. But uh, in general, you know, I mean, our focus has been on, on the parenting aspect of things and uh, it's, it's been hard, you know, doing the, the, the homeschooling. Um, but it's also been really rich. I mean, like I'm really enjoying seeing, I don't know, spending more time with my son and kind of getting a one-on-one and like, how, how does he learn? How does he think? How does he respond? You know? Um, and then seeing, and then the less fun side is how do I respond? Maybe not as graciously as I should, and <laughs> maybe a little more anger than I should. Um, and it's kind of funny because initially my wife was kind of the the one, you know, call me aside saying, "Hey, you need to calm down and you know, respond this way or whatever." And now it's it's, I mean, my wife's great, but I but I think her um, our roles have kind of changed as far as like our our wicks. Uh, you know, I've learned to deal with my son a little more, a little more empathetically, you know, a little more like, Hey, I, I'm really glad you, you, you know, you're really passionate about what you're doing. You got this energy and this and that's, you know, but I'm a little disappointed because, you know, this is what we agreed to. And, um, 
just kind of that as opposed to my default, which is like just yelling and cussing, <laughs> um, <laughs> which doesn't, you know, it doesn't show off uh, God very well. So um, it's not good for anyone. So, um, so I'm kind of rambling a little bit, but so it's, it's basically, it's been hard, but it's, I've also seen God's goodness in it and uh, partially for my sake, but I also try to remind you know, my wife and my son in the big picture, like, what do we have to be grateful for? You know, like, mm-hmm. yes, this aspect of today was hard, but we've got clean water and we have food and God's providing for us. And uh, we got this awesome podcast. Yeah. You know, I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. So <laughs> awesome. So. Awesome. Uh, Joe, feel free to chime in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, wow. So I remember when you sent me this, I was like, this is a super loaded question. And um, I was like, I need to answer this from, I guess, my perspective from what I've observed and from personal experiences. But uh you know, from what I've seen, at least in my state, seeing up, I guess I'm, I'm in Alabama, and I feel like we're almost like the last state to go on lockdown, the last state to really, I guess, start taking it seriously. <laughs> it's been so nonchalant, and it's kind of has me concerned in how people are, are reacting to it. Um, it's almost like people are acting lazy about it and how they mm. how they had to re- how they react to this pandemic. And um, again, this is my lens is what I'm seeing it through. Uh, it's probably a lot different in your guys' area or in East coast or the Midwest, wherever it may be. But, um, you know, I think one thing for me that I kind of took from this was as Christians, we're still called to pray and to look for God, look to God for guidance in this time, of, like it's very major uncertainty. Um, you know, this apply, we, we need to be applying biblical teachings, I think, and knowledge that remind us daily of the things that we know to be true as Christians. So more importantly, I guess, for us as husbands and as fathers, you know, we're called to be leaders, we're called to be protectors, we're called to be providers, among many other things. Um, you know, those aren't our only things, but those are some, mm-hmm. of the, some of the ones that kind of stick out when you think of father and husband. Um, I feel like this is, just as, this is just important now as it was before the pandemic. Um, and just because we're missing a pandemic doesn't mean we look to God less. And this is something that I have to remind myself daily. And, you know, I'm not perfect. I fail at that. But um, two of the examples, I know I share this with the Christian bring off, but two of the examples that come to mind is when Jesus spent his time in the desert for 40 days, uh, mm-hmm. reference Matthew 4, 1 through 11, um, or another time when Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was literally sweating blood because of the anguish that was over him. Um, Luke 22, 41 through 44, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Jesus needed God in very trying and very difficult times. And I think that we as men, uh, as fathers and husbands, were called to that also. We probably, you guys have probably seen that as well, just even in the, uh, you know, monotony of the daily, you know, daily grind, being at home versus maybe being out and working uh, in a different atmosphere. Um, these are just a couple examples we can look to, though of how, you know, our Savior needs guidance through, um, and strength through the, his Heavenly Father in times of need. Um, so just like Jesus had to fully rely on God, I think we just, it's a good reminder for us as husbands and fathers that we also need to remember to fully rely on God. And that's not easy. Um, you know, it doesn't come without its daily challenges that um, because of our sinful nature, you know, some of the things that for me that get in the way are pride, greed, envy, jealousy, slander blame shifting laziness unrighteous anger um and, you know i'm sure you guys can probably resonate with this and i'm sure some of the listeners can resonate with this among other things um and these are you know these are simple distractions these are shortcomings but we are people we are fallen we are sinful by nature but the great great thing is that we have a god that we have a savior who died for us for those things um you know i think one of the things that you i'd shared is we're not in control of anything that's going on right now. You know, that, and one of the reasons I say that is because I can't stop this by myself. I can't turn coronavirus off, right? Um, I can't help that. I know people that are losing jobs or worse than that um, have had to face the F word, furlough. Hmm. That's pretty terrifying. I, I consider that like the new F word <laughs> today, right? Um, it's kind of scary. It's kind of terrifying especially when I know I have coworkers that have gone through that. So, um, but in all of that to say, you know, it's a good reminder that hey, we're not in control. We have to rely on God. It's a daily struggle. Yes. It's challenging. Yes. Um, but I think it's even more so in this time of uncertainty that we are called to be faithful and to look to a God who can provide and who can change things and who is faithful. So, um, 
that's really loaded. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, and, and this is this is a topic that, you know, we could we could spend an entire uh, season of episodes on. And so um, I just wanted to get your guys kind of takes on this. Um, for me, uh, I've I've been somewhat surprised to see people that I would consider uh, have pretty strong faith in Christ and, you know, a, a crisis um, like the pandemic or simply the pandemic hits. And it's like their faith kind of unravels uh, that they um, kind of like more of their faith was in a financial system or an economic system or um, a, a political party uh, or a healthcare system. Like, and, and Jesus really is kind of like fire insurance, you know, like, okay, uh, Jesus has got me covered, you know, for when I die. But until then, my faith is going to be in um the my other ideologies that are more impactful on a day-to-day -day basis and so i've been really i've been really like surprised at that and and i know that i'm i'm fairly guilty of of looking to other things to provide me comfort or looking to other things as kind of functional saviors and um i, I think that's what's really impactful for me as a dad even just to have this conversation with you guys as other dads is that um like i look to plenty of other things uh, as functional saviors. Like, um, I, I look to reward myself as a dad. I look to other things to give me a sense of control when things are out of control. And certainly right now, I feel like I don't have any control, um, other than like maybe my own house and my own kids, but like, that's it. Um, and, uh, I, I thought, you know what, this is a really, this is a really perfect conversation to have right now, because I'm sure that there's other dads that, um, are feeling exactly uh, the same way. And so uh, what, in my mind, what obviously, not obviously, because there's probably people that don't believe this way, but uh, what separates Christianity uh, from many other religions and other faiths out there is everything's already done for you. You know, everything is, everything's done. Uh, and, and you just, you simply accept the gift of grace that um, God offers through his son, Jesus Christ, uh, through his death and life and burial and resurrection. Um, on the cross and in the reverse order. Um, and uh, that, that to me um, is amazing, but that's taken a long time to apply to my life. Uh, whereas I've treated Jesus more like a means to an end in a lot of ways. Uh, and I think there's probably a lot of dads out there that uh, react to many things that way. Uh, uh, well, if, if uh, this $60,000 a year job doesn't provide me happiness and I'm going to go to another place or if this home doesn't provide me happiness, I'm going to go to another place or if this marriage or, or if these kids or if these toys don't provide me happiness, I'm going to go there. If Jesus, you know, people are promising, you know, hope and fulfillment and whatever happiness with Jesus, if that doesn't work, then I'm going to go elsewhere. It's like people as dads, we, we can't treat Jesus as a means to an end. We can't kind of just have vending machine theology I don't know if that makes sense to you guys, where we just kind of yeah. go and pick the thing that, you know, okay, I'm, I'm hungry. I'm going to pick that thing. I'm going to pick Jesus off the shelf, pick G I'm gonna put my money in and here comes Jesus. And okay, that's going to satiate me and I'm going to be good. Um, yeah, we're using, I, using Jesus to get what we want in life. We're still trying to yeah. be in control. I mean, we're still yeah. trying to control things. Yes. Um, so I, I, I was, as I was, thinking about uh, some scripture this week, um, I shared with you guys at the beginning of this, a, a verse that's come up for me a lot is 1 Thessalonians 5.18. And it says, um, if I'm remembering, not maybe not verbatim, but uh, give thanks in all of your circumstances for it is um, the will of God through Christ Jesus for you. Uh, it might be different in different translations. And then Matthew chapter four, verses 35 through 40. And I'm not going to go over all of those, but the sum that one up it's jesus literally tells a storm to shut up and uh like calm down and he does it in front of his disciples who are literally fearing for their lives and i gotta imagine disciples who are like veteran uh longshoremen you know like they've been out in boats they've worked hard days you know they're not going to get really scared by a little squall you know or a, a small rainstorm like this like i have to imagine this was like hurricane level or something like that like a category one hurricane mm -hmm. that's bearing down on them you know and they're like we're gonna lose our lives you know and jesus just comes up and tells the hurricane all right shut up and and then says to the disciples do you not have faith 
you, do you, do you still not get it? You know, and, and I thought about this and I was like, you know what? Jesus is Lord over all. And, and I think that's a message that I would love to be able to communicate to, to dads that don't even know Christ is like, maybe they look at, maybe they look at just about anything right now as, as a, um, Hey, what's going to provide hope? What's going to provide happiness? What's going to take the tension um, and relief? What's going to provide me relief? And um, simply put, Jesus is, is Lord over all. And so if he's, if he can tell a hurricane to shut up, um, then he's Lord over a pandemic and he's Lord um, over the coronavirus. And I don't believe that Jesus uh, uh, created the pandemic um, or that he created the coronavirus. Um, there, there might be some theological nuances that we can talk about in terms of God's omniscience and omnipotence and um, uh, being all powerful, but we believe that he is over all of creation. And I think there, that, in, that provides a lot of hope to me as a dad. Okay, I talked a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Thoughts? No, that's, I, li- I really like that. Um, I'm going to rabbit hole for a second if that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it's a really good reminder uh, that you know, God may not created the pandemic, but God is still in control and good things can come out of this good faith can be produced out of this um, stronger belief can be, can be uh, produced out of this. And so for some people, they may find themselves that this is an ultimate trial. A, you know, and I, you know, I find myself in that where, like I said, if I had to completely relinquish control because I cannot change the state of where we're at as a nation globally, anything. All I can rely on God uh, daily to mm. provide answers, provide solutions. Um, one more thing I wanted to, allude to um my wife actually reminded me of this earlier and it was this came from i believe jackie hill perry talked about this if you don't know that name look her up she's awesome her yeah. husband are awesome but um she mentioned how all the disciples or most of the disciples were uh were fishermen right mm-hmm. their their craft their profession was fishermen well most often when jesus is going to see them or going or calling them they're fishermen catching no fish right mm-hmm. so they're supposed to be really good at their profession I'm an engineer. If I'm failing in my job every day, I'm probably not going to be an engineer for very long, right? But, um, but, but Jesus goes to them and went on down days that they're catching no fish. Cast your net over here. They cast their net and they bring in all this fish, right? So, yeah, they had to rely on God and Jesus to do that. Professional fishermen. <laughs> so how much more when we relinquish control to God that, we see better results that we, that things come through that answers get, the questions get answered, that prayers get um, maybe, maybe answered or maybe even um, uh, they, they, it's a, it's a silent answer sometimes, or sometimes yep. it's a, it's a, it's a prayer of promise for later. Um, yep. But just, just my, my two cents on that. No, I love that. I hadn't even thought about that, that piece where <laughs> when Jesus came to the disciples, they weren't ever catching anything. <laughs> Right, right. They were always like, day, you know, hours on end or whatever. Oh, we've been here from since morning. We haven't caught a single fish. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I love, I love that because ultimately Jesus, Jesus provides. I, I think that's that's great. Christian, any thoughts? Uh, all sorts of thoughts. Let's see if I can make them uh, coherent. <laughs> um, I mean, that that's kind of the the catch twenty two. The the challenge of like part of what makes America so great is also kind of antithetical to the gospel self-reliance pull yourself up by bootstraps you can make your own destiny um those are good things but not when they're replacing god not when you're trying to take control from god um and that's that's a that's challenging you know and and i think sometimes it takes a pandemic like this to at least for me reveal kind of my heart of like my security is in my ability to make money provide food and have money in the bank um you know, and, and so, and that's something that, you know, I feel silly, you know, kind of admitting it, but like when something's not going my right, I'm stressing out. My wife's like, have you prayed about it? And I'm like, no, no, I have, I've not consulted the creator of the universe. I have not. No, nope. <laughs> maybe that'd be a good thing to do. Um, you know, and, and, but it just reveals my heart of like, you know, being kind of an entrepreneur and stuff like I'm, I'm used to, if I don't make it happen, it doesn't happen. I'm used to that mentality. Um, and and I think for you know most of us it takes something like this to show us how little we're in control of our lives. You know, mm-hmm. we kind of have this illusion that we're in control, um, but we're not really. And 
we'd be better off if we realized we weren't and we we're more reliant on God. Um, I mean, I remember one of the transformational things for me as a young, as a young Christian man was realizing that the main attribute of Jesus wasn't, you know, his um, miracles. I mean, it was amazing. He's, you know, God's son and, and whatnot, but it was, it was his reliance on God. He himself had nothing without his reliance on God. And that's what we're called to. We're, we're called to rely on God hundred percent, you know, and, and to me, I'm like, that's, that's very humbling and it's not very intuitive. Uh, and it's definitely goes against what we're taught as our value system as go-getter Americans, you know, so trying to balance that out is, is challenging. You, I'm going to ask you a question if you don't mind real quick. <clears throat> yeah, Do you think as, as, as men, as husbands, as fathers, because men are typically wired this way that we compartmentalize a lot of things. So we compartmentalize areas of control in our lives and we say, okay, God, you can have, you can have my marriage, you can have um, my kids, but I'm going to keep my work. I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep the month, the financial aspect of my life. I'm going to keep uh, assets. I'm going to keep other, you know, fill in the blank, whatever the things that you want to hold on that you think you have control. Do you think we have a hard time of, um, you know, relinquishing control or, or maybe even relinquishing, relinquishing those idols in our life that we just want to hold on to so hard. What do you guys think about that? I would, I'd say yes. Um, and I'd say a lot of the time, I don't think we realize that we're doing that. Um, Cause you know, we know as Christian men, we're not supposed to, but like, you know, bring off kind of alluded to, you know, kind of these functional saviors of like, I, I will, I will be saved by my ability to be successful at work or bring home money or be a good dad or whatever. Um, and when we get to the end of ourselves, realize we can't do it by our own strength. You know, like that's, that's a very hard thing, hard wall to, to come up against. But, it, but I think that our ability to compartmentalize is something that God created in us. I mean, that's how people can go to war and function in chaos and with their life. That's a good point. Life. Yeah, that's a really you good know, point. But then we bring that home and we try to hold on to things as opposed to giving it all to God. Yeah, I, I, I don't have a ton more to say on that because I think Christian, you know, you summed it up pretty well. Um, I, I think that there's always an inner wrestling, especially for husbands and fathers of who's in control and to submit to um, a creator God. Um, I think that is kind of an affront to the way that we think and the way that we function, even though submitting to a creator God is originally how we were supposed to function. Um, and originally how we were supposed to do things. So I think there's always just an inner wrestling with um, we're not God. Um, we're not kings. We are um, we're, we're children, you know, like we're children of God and, and we are um, we're heirs, but that's that's different than being God. And and so I think like there's always that fine balance of 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 being like a head steward, really, like a, being a good steward of, of what has been given to you. And as husbands and fathers, you know, we're given marriages, we're given um, kids, we're given uh, jobs, property, possessions, and things. And, and those are all like, they're not ours, but they're ours to take care of. And, and I think it's always really, really important to remember as fathers, especially during this time is like, we're the bodies, the brains, the emotions, the relationships, the possessions that we have, they're all given to us and they're hundred percent gods. He just lends it to us for maybe 80 or 90 years. Um, and, we're supposed to steward those things well. And, um, and if we look at stewardship, if we look at our life as stewardship, then I think we approach life a lot differently. But if we look at life um, like it's ours, it's an ownership, then I think, um, I think things can go sour fast. So um, I know I, I said like I that. wasn't going to, I know, I, I know I said I wasn't going to add more to that, but I think that's, that's, that's what I, that's what I come up, come up with. No, that's awesome. I like that. I like, I like the reminder of the idea of stewardship that, like you said, God lends us these things. He puts us responsible for, you know, insert what you have in your life, but ultimately you are not in charge of them. You are not over them, ruling over them in control, but you are responsible for them. And you're always yielding to God for guidance, for, for um, knowledge, for wisdom. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, I think we're kind of coming near, near the end of our time. Um, uh, I don't, I can't remember. Where's my clock here? Let me pull my clock up. Christian, you might, you might know where things are at. Um, 
yeah, we're, we're right at the mark. We're at the 15 minute mark or so, but, um, I want to, um, uh, Joe, is there anything that you might want to say to any dad that maybe doesn't know about Christ and maybe just having some stress or anxiety? Maybe you could, um, neatly package everything and everything that you are in two sentences. No, I'm kidding. But, uh, <laughs> sure. Uh, anything, sure. anything that you would say to a, maybe a non-believing dad? Yes. Yeah. Um, who has, that <laughs> that's a challenge. Um, so I guess if, if for non-believing dads, um, you know, understand that there is higher power that created you, that loves you, that wants to be in your life that you can fully rely on. Um, and that you can fully trust and, and that will be there for you and that will lift all the burdens off your shoulders if you if you turn and believe in him um it doesn't make things easier but it does make life more approachable more palatable understanding that there are other people that believe the same things you do they're going through the same struggles and hardships as you are um and, and they're placing their faith in something that's greater than them that has died for them, that, that loves them, that cares for them, that just deeply wants to have a relationship with you. I think that's, that would be my advice to um, dads that aren't believers that may be seeking, you know, a higher calling or understanding at this time. Love it. Love it. Love it. Uh, Christian, any final thoughts? I mean, just as, you know, to, to that question, I was just kind of thinking me, my wife and I, kind of joke but not really you know about how, how because marriage was hard then we had a kid and we're like oh this is next level you know uh challenging sacrifice uh refining you know to use christian speak um you know we joke about like i don't i don't understand how not christians can keep a marriage together or can you know be not just totally shitty parents <laughs> you know i mean <laughs> i have trouble doing that and i've got jesus you know um you know and so i guess the thing for me, you know, if, if I guess you're not, you know, you're not a Christian listening to this for me, the, the thing that brought me to, to Christ really had to do with looking at like the beauty of the world and the complexity of the world and say, how can there not be a creator? Nowhere else do, do you see, you know, uh, a, 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 you know, a supercar going down the road and say, Oh, that was just an accident. Well, no, there's clearly you know, like it functions. It's beautiful. You know, there's something uh, provocative about it you know, you don't just look at the sunset and be like, well, yeah, it's just an accident. Like, it just doesn't make sense, you know. Now, there's a whole, you know, conversation about whether or not that God's good or bad or whatever, but like, there, seem, there seems to me there has to be some sort of designer, and the one that resonates with me is, is the one of the Bible, the creator, God of the Bible, so. Nice, nice. Um, and, I, and I'll lastly say to uh, any dad that's out there listening, Christian or not, um, Look, if you're experiencing any anxiety or depression, there really is no shame in you like popping in to see a counselor. Like, um, and I'm not trying to plug myself as a mental health counselor, but that is my profession. That's what I do. And uh, I think that more dads can use counseling and at least some level of just objective accountability. And, and if you're experiencing that, you know what, now's not necessarily time to pull yourself up by the bootstraps and simply just, you know, uh, grind it out and be a tougher man. That's not what we're trying to do here. Um, I think if you're experiencing anxiety and depression, go see a counselor. I think that's uh, I think that's really really important. Um, second, of all I'm gonna I'm gonna agree with the the other two guys here. Man, there's a God that absolutely loves you. And if you don't know how to pray to that God, um, you know what? Do this. Close your eyes tonight before you go to bed or when, whenever, and just say, "All right, God, I don't know who you are." Um, and this. A uh, weirdo dad podcast told me to say some words to you. Uh, so I'm going to say some words. If you're there, can you please um, respond, talk to me? Um, I'd, I'd love to, I'd love to know, love to know and get to know you. Um, that's a prayer. That can be a prayer. So say that. Also know that we're going to be praying for you guys. We love you guys. Um, and we are going to be walking with you. If you got um, questions on anxiety, depression. I am a licensed mental health counselor. I can do my best to answer those for you. Um, Joe is a licensed uh, bourbon, well, certified bourbon. Uh, he'll get to that license <laughs> pretty soon. Certified bourbon steward. He can answer your bourbon questions. Um, and Christian is a licensed real estate owner. He can answer your uh, real estate questions. We're all Christians. We love Jesus. And we can certainly answer your the theological uh, questions. So um, Joe, I want to say thank you for 
uh, being a part of the podcast tonight. I hope this isn't the uh, last time that you join us. Uh, if it is because this episode tanks, then we're not going to have you on again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry if I ruined it and I turned everybody <laughs> off. But no, I had a great time tonight. Loved uh, catching up with both of you guys. And uh, this was a lot of fun. So I'd love to do it again sometime. Thank you. And um, thank you, Christian. And um, uh, you can find Joe on of class uh, of cask. And you said it a little different than I would pronounce, but Claro. I yeah, think. I'm sorry. I'm Italian and I can't not roll my R's. So hey, that's, kinda, that's fine. A... <laughs> I wanted to say at of class cat and not class of uh, cask and Claro. That's what yeah. I want to call it. Yeah, anyway, phonetical way to uh, say it, of cask and Claro. That way everybody probably can look it up easier but <laughs> there we go you can find them there fantastic uh, uh bourbon and cigar um education and fun and uh you can find christian c town real estate you can find me denim and whiskey but ultimately you can find all of this on the old-fashioned dad podcast uh, uh instagram page hopefully we'll continue to roll out more content episodes uh feel free to leave us comments uh, but until next time i'm christian bringoff i'm christian harris i'm joe castaldo Thank you for joining us on the Old Fashioned Dad Podcast. Take care.